there just wasn't ever it like i said there was no other option i was like this is it i will do this and i'm gonna die try doing it like it was just like the only thing i remember watching like a, that kobe Bryant documentary and i remember I, this was even after that but i related to that so much there was so many things he said that it was the only option and and that's how i felt about it and i had that mentality and i just kept with it Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to It's the Bearded Man podcast with your favorite, the world's favorite bearded man, Bob Bay. Each week with our guest episodes, I try to put the spotlight on someone who in my eyes is living their most authentic life. Today's guest was born in San Diego, California and raised in Reno, Nevada. He's a filmmaker, photographer, and designer with an ambitious eye and a unique raw talent that is unmatched. Some mentionable commercial clients include USA Today, Red Bull, RCA, Toyota, LinkedIn, and more. Some artist clients include Taylor Swift, Charlie Puth, Bryce Vine, John Legend, Black Bear, Quinn92, and more. In 2019, he won Video of the Year at the MTV Music Video Awards for Taylor Swift's You Need to Calm Down. Today on the podcast, fellow bearded brother, Drew Kirsch, baby. How What's we doing? On? Good man, Dude. fellow bearded brother. Fellow. I have a very small beard. But you know what? Whenever I can add that in the intro of the podcast for the guests, I feel so hyped <laughs> because it's the bearded man branding, and it's like, oh, this guy's already getting plus two points if he's coming out with a podcast. So epic. Well, hyped thank to you have you here me. today, man. Hyped to have you here today. Um, when I see your work, it's and I, I I've heard you talk about this in other podcasts and other conversations, but like your work is very distinguishable from a lot of different people. Like, you know, clicking in to a Drew Kirsch music video, what to expect, the feel, the aesthetic, uh, even like a blender will show up, maybe some milk, some eggs. Like there's certain things about your, t- your, your videos that is so clear. It's like, this is Drew Kirsch. I don't even need to see it in the intro of like video directed by Drew Kirsch. Um, and I feel like that took quite some time to probably find that, that um way to portray yourself and through this visual work how did you have the confidence to really go outside the norm and and like find that find that lane of yours because when you're creating the lane i feel like it's very hard people might question you like why why are you doing it this way and then when it's established it's so like oh of course like that's what drew does how did you have the confidence to to actually approach that i mean it was really the only option like Mm. there was other music video directors they had their thing and I knew I needed mine if I wanted to to stick out, and, mm. and I knew I wanted to be bold and 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 uh, do what you just said. I wanted people to look at something and be like, "Oh, that's probably done by Drew." Yeah, uh, you know. So it, it wasn't really, I'd say, confidence. It was just like there was no other option. Mm. It was yeah. So um, and I knew I needed. I, I wanted to find that style. Like actually, I first started with like black and white, which was kind of crazy and. I just did that because I didn't have money to to uh, get different light. There was different even when you shoot film, you need like different lights, obviously, and like different. I was using like house lights, and those have different color temperatures, so yeah. it would look like a really like crappy image. But if I threw it in black and white, you wouldn't be able to tell. So it was always trying to like what would make my image look the best. Mm. Um, and then yeah, I, style just had to like kind of just you, you need it. I yeah. Think. How important was it, I know early on, especially in filmmaking, like you don't really have budgets. And I think one of the first artists that you got a budget was with Black Bear. But leading up to Black Bear, how important was it for you to make use of the little to maybe no research that you even had access to? Because I feel like so much of it is fake it till you make it, right? Like I always joke about, I record my my podcast out of the bed studio, the bedroom studio, but I own it and it's part of like the brand at this point. There one day will be a studio and it's gonna be lights, camera, action, but it, it, along the journey of it, you kind of have to find ways to sell it even if it's not the top tier production. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was always just being super resourceful. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. I was talking about this the other day, like, it was finding the locations for free ones that weren't going to get me shut down. I never had a permit or anything to shoot these places. So it was a com. you know, I'd go downtown to the arts district and, and order thrift stores to find items to use in my music videos, stuff that I could get for free. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, the early days I would do shit like buy a lens and then like return, return it. it. <laughs> like, 
But I mean, it was, yeah, it was really just at the end of the day, being resourceful. Like how can you figure out, you know, a way to, to make something happen with nothing. And, and uh, people use this example all the time. Like you should, for like people who are telling, doing like short films, well, you know, you might have to act in your own short film at first. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of thing, but, Mm -hmm. um, obviously there's a lot of technical work that needs to be done and, 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 uh, cinema. So it was, uh, yeah, like I said, like finding like house lamps from my own bedroom. Like I would use like the couch from my house and take it to a parking lot and put someone in it and shoot them, you know, and then have to lug that. Luckily I had a truck. I can imagine not having a truck to do all this, but yeah, just being resourceful and, and using uh, people around you, your friends and as long as you feed them, yeah, get them, get them a twelve yeah, pack. Totally, then they're sold. They'll do yeah. whatever you want. It's the cheapest labor, but twelve even, pack. But even fast forward to today, when you when the budgets are there, you still have thrown yourself into music videos for like the first one I just think of right now is the Charlie Puth girlfriend. When you sh- you're at the door with like both foods in your hand, do you enjoy just like subtly throwing yourself into opportunities like that, or did it just need to happen for whatever reason? On that one, it just needed to happen. There was no one else to play the role at the time. It was. Just last minute, mm. um, how we added that in, but uh, I mean, to be honest, I s- kind of like it. I think it's like oh, really, I, I think it's really cool <laughs> when some like certain directors like take that one role in their movies, and I think I want to do the same thing. It's got to be small. I'm not good in front of camera. I'm not good on, on these things. Like, oh, you do great. You know, I, 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 I like heard being some of your behind. podcasts. You you do great. I, I think <laughs> I think you're just not uh, used to hearing your own voice are uh, obviously talking. This is a different medium than anything you've ever done before, but you know what you're doing. You you do a great job of speaking and articulating and storytelling of some of your story, but uh, I think it's just reps. It, if you keep doing these opportunities, like jumping on podcasts, mm-hmm. I think you're just gonna see how easy it is. And I think you're gonna be amazed of, of the amount of people that are gonna gravitate towards and appreciate it because they know you for your pieces but they don't really know drew inside they don't know the stories they don't know what it's taking you to get to where to say because we all just see like the end result where you are in 2021 but in reality this is just the product of easily 10 years in the making to get you to this place yeah you appreciate know? it yeah now i learn more and more that people want to know mm. more they want to see behind the scenes they want to hear from me and that yeah. stuff it just gets hard i mean but I try to do my best. Yeah, I mean, you're a busy man, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's not easy to just uh, just to fit that in. Um, it, another thing that I thought was really interesting about your story is it wasn't even until college where you really like started to go all in on this. It's actually after college. Like, after, so even yeah. after college, okay. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I I went in a little bit on it. Like I knew I I was pretty sure I want, knew I wanted to do it. Mm. I mean, I moved to LA for it. Totally. I mean, I was like, I'm gonna do this, but I didn't really know until I was down here, probably six months to a year. Uh, high hopes of going to UCLA, that didn't happen. And then it was just, it was a, a combination of like, all right, this is the only option. I'm not going back home, mm. and uh, and I just wanted it. I wanted it more than anything. What I still ab- do. What about I mean, it was what what. Because I, I think growing up, you had like made some skate videos here and there. It, yeah. it kind of was a, a I mean, passion project. Being young, the thing that just scared me was having a nine to five. Like I just, mm. I can't, even to this day, like I can't work in the same spot. Like I could never sit at the same desk. Uh, even I'm working at home now, like I, I don't you're sit always, in the same spot changing. or I go to the coffee shop. Yeah, I'm always changing. I'm on the road. Mm. Uh, I think that's just part of my personality and it just scared me to death if I was going to have to do the same thing over and over day after day, no matter how much money I was making it, it, that was just, I was like, I'd rather be, you know, not broke, but, uh, Mm. not making as much money. But I, as long as I was happy, that was like, that was the number one goal. It's just, I just want to be happy and like, make sure I'm going to be happy 15 years from now or 20 years from now or whatever it was Mm. at the time. So I was honestly, yeah, I was scared. I was like a scared 19, 20 year old. And that, I wanted to find a job or career that uh, would make me happy. And this was what I landed on. And that's when I really started diving in and and loving it. Mm. And then that kind of came, came in there too. I was like, I love this. I want to do this forever. I don't ever want to retire. Like I just want to do it until such a beautiful, if you can find that thing that it's like retirement doesn't even exist when you love what you actually do. It, it still does. But I mean, it, yeah, it, 
blows my mind that yeah. like to get paid to do this. How did you get through the early self doubt moments? I think the hardest part is when that light bulb hits, you know what you want to do, but yet you have so much to prove to the world. You have so much to prove to yourself. Did you ever find yourself questioning? Is this the right decision? Am I ever going to make it? Were there any of those moments or I see a little bit of a smirk on your face. You're like, Not I fucking really knew. I knew I was I mean, dialed. God, there just wasn't ever it. Like I said, there was no other option. I was like, this is it. I will do this. And um, yeah, like I'm going to die, try doing it. Like it was just like the only thing. Yeah. I remember watching like a like Kobe Bryant documentary <sighs> and I remember I, this was even after that, but I related to that so much. There was so many things he said that, it was the only option and and that's how i felt about it and i had that mentality and i just kept with it yeah yeah i think that's a good if uh that's a great way to find you're always going to find a way to get to where you want to be when it becomes this like there's no question of if it's just yeah. a matter of when yeah and then you just start navigating the challenges that yeah. come along the way and there's different levels right like totally and you know people like i the whole reason i'm on this podcast like i've had like uh, some gauge this success as, as different. You know, I, I for me, this is just a sliver of the success I want to be at. Mm. And so, yeah, I'm I'm like just getting started. And some <laughs> people are like, "Well, you know, you're doing great." I'm like, "No, I'm not. Like, this is not. I'm not done." What What gets you to the next level? Not nearly done. What gets you to the next level? I mean, I'm gearing up for a feature right now. Mm, and that's a, that's got to be a big project. Huge, huge project. But, I mean, that has been the goal for a long time now. And, and it, yeah, I'll be well deep in that world. How long will that take production process-wise compared to, obviously? I actually just left a meeting before this about really? it. And they just told me the days that they're bidding for, which is 30 days. So, uh, sometimes that seems a little short for the average viewer, I think. But, yeah, I mean... A lot of movies are shot under 30 days. Wow. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, but it's just a grind for that 30. It's yeah. like full throttle. Yeah, end of watch that movie. I think it was shot in like seven days, which is crazy. Seven days? Yeah. There's, there's, there's a handful of movies that sh are shot, you know, the short periods of time. So, yeah, I was stoked to hear 30 days. I think that's like a good time period. We're either going to shoot in New Mexico or Utah. So I'll be living out there for few months next year wow oh because there's obviously a whole planning process before you actually go into the full production. yeah and i just i want to like um really immerse myself in the setting which will actually be las vegas too the movie mm -hmm. takes place in las vegas but we'll shoot it most of it in new mexico or utah and then uh a few days in las vegas to trick the viewer oh my god like seen, yeah it's pretty wild <laughs> Yeah, that's incredible. What's been uh, what's been one of the biggest challenges you've ever faced on a set, whether it's commercial or it's music video? Uh, well, time is always the biggest challenge. Allowing enough time for not only myself but everyone who's working their ass off on set to do what they want to do to photograph. Really, mm. that's always the biggest thing. Like, I, I always want more time. You know, you got to stay within a budget, and usually the budget is a uh, constricted by time and yeah. um so yeah i mean that's the that's always the biggest like hurdle right you're always rushing to like get as much done as you can in that short period of time so um but something more specific I'm trying to think of, like a good story i could give you um or do you feel like you you and your team do such a good job pre-planning that if challenges do occur there's always a way to pivot around no, no. it there's always a challenge there's always a challenge every single every shot i learned that day one from someone else they were like filmmaking is like problem solving it's constantly wow having to like dodge a different hurdle or jump a different hurdle and like figure out um you know those maneuvers but Man, I wish I could give you something, a good specific story. But I mean, I, listen, it's not all perfect. Like I've had videos that have never come out and that sucks to, your, to have to say that. Your decision or the client? Clients, yeah. I mean, I've had uh, videos come out too where the client has released something and I've taken my name off it because I'm just not happy with it. And sometimes that can be uh, my fault. It can be their fault. It could be a crew member's fault. I mean really depends but a lot of directors will not admit that there's a lot of directors that have canned videos some of the biggest in the world and wow a lot of people just don't know it but yeah Sheesh. 
It happens, right? It's crazy. The music industry is also just nuts. I mean, especially in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, they would shoot these music videos for a million bucks. They didn't like it. Can it? Shoot another one for a million bucks. Nowadays, it's a little bit different. If you're so. shooing it, it's getting it's getting pushed through. I mean, for the, for the most part, part the, for the yeah, depending on the level of artists, they still can a lot of videos. I've I've done, I think two or three videos that were they were canned previously, and then I did the the revamp of the new one. Wow! And that's always a weird feeling because it just sucks for the other director, and I've been on that side too, and yeah, just work your ass off for something and you th- might think it's great and someone else doesn't they don't release it and just heartbreaking oh man that's can't rough. put it on your website can't put it in your reel can't even talk just about it probably lives in oh, wherever it lives God. on a hard drive <laughs> yeah i can't even talk about it yeah god Correct. that's horrible how um when you're when you're working with these high level talents whether it was you know the taylor swift the charlie poofs i mean quinn 92 i mean these are you know high they are high level talent how do you ensure that the day that comes shoots that the process is easy for them, that the final edit they're happy with. Is there like a process that you've learned how to ensure that the client is happy with it? Yeah. I mean, communication is key. Like that is the biggest part. It's up to the artists as well. Like some of these artists, they step out. They're like, I don't want to deal with it. You deal with it. It depends on their level of engagement. Um, You know, some are heavily, heavily involved and I have them on a text message basis Mm. And it's easy. Like we can fire off cuts to each other, give notes. I don't have anyone stepping in between us. That's like the best route. Mm -hmm. Then you have a different route where you might have to go through the label. The label then does their thing. Then they give it to the management. Management does their thing. Then the artist sees it or some sort of uh, line of communication like that. And it just is not as not as seamless and yeah. things get muddy and yeah, I like it when it's just the artists, myself, let us handle it. The label and yeah. the management can look at it after and give us any like legal notes or whatever. But I feel like from a, a previous podcast I listened to you on, I feel like your relationship with Quinn 92 is like, he just fully trusts you slash probably has a blast with like rifting ideas between you guys. But no, it, yeah. I mean, it, it, him and uh, his manager too super Jesse, great yeah Jesse great Kong, like great guy we're all just I mean, at the end of the day with them like we're just friends so like it's easy for us to communicate like and just it's like group chat like they're easy i'm easy going like mm. it's smooth mm. and we hang out on the side of work and like so it's there's just something there that's a little more i don't want to say more authentic than others but it's more than just business it's friendships. Yeah, yeah. We just have a really good collaboration process, and the truth is, is Coin ninety two and myself have very similar taste. Mm. I mean, we both love like same movies and, and and same kind of styles for the most part, yeah. at least in the things that we've done. So, and in those stages of the process, it was always easy to go back and forth on like references and yeah stuff. Yeah. Where where does the interest for you come from with, with that like that retro retro loud colors like aesthetic is there certain things in your childhood or certain things growing up that you gravitated towards or where where does that really stem from um yeah i mean i think it's a little bit everything it could be uh something from yeah childhood for sure or it could be something i've seen in a vintage ad or like something some sort of advertisement or uh photo shoot that i've seen in the past that i just really liked i don't know that that's happened where i'm like oh they put a i don't know snake in like this shoot from the 80s on whoever and i thought it was amazing like what if we put a snake on this person or whatever you know i it depends but yeah i don't i don't know it's it kind of just felt it kind of just happened too i'd say the retro thing might have come to from thrifting mm. like i was thrifting for a, all my early videos so when you're thrifty and you find a lot of uh, old vintage that's, things. That's most of the stuff you're going to be finding anyway. Uh, some people call junk. But we were like, oh, oh this that's is a great free prop. So you, so it almost then becomes a question. Had you just had big budgets from the jump, would you have found this as this like vintage aesthetic? It's a good question. I, mm, I do not that's know. That's a million dollar question. I know you can't answer it, but yeah. it's. Yeah, because yeah, I've never really been so specific about like a time period. Like I'm not like, oh, this video is set in the 80s. Like, or this video is set in the 2000s. Like, it it might like have that theme overall, but I don't mind mixing 
different uh, time periods, mm-hmm. unless it's like a really specific story. But uh, you know, I, I, music videos. There's no rules. There is no rules. There's no rules. You get to create whatever you want. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> you are your own boss at the end of the day when you're the director of it. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Um, 2019, obviously. I mean, this is like something you can't just glaze over. And I also think it's interesting timing because you need to calm down. Came out June 17th today. As we record, this is June 15th. So in two days, it's two years. It's been out. It's It's over 250 million views. Um, obviously an opportunity like that. And I know there was, you also shot another music video for her at the same time. Um, you know, I would imagine going into it, there's no idea that this is going to become the music video of the year. So you approach it probably like any other opportunity. You crush it. Everyone involved crushes it. But when you land such an amazing opportunity, it was great to see you on stage. I watched the video, all blue, suit, just dialed in. Uh, looking back, like, is there, or even while it's happening, is there like a takeaway for you? Uh, is there a lesson in that process? Did you approach this opportunity like differently than anything else? Like how, how does that such a big moment, uh, either propel you forward or what do you learn from it? Dude, I was just giddy the whole time. I was so thankful. Oh, you were, you were cheesing on stage. I was loving seeing to it. To just be there. I like, I just kept telling, every maybe 10 minutes I would tell myself like, all right, like take a deep breath and take all this in. Like this is such a once in a lifetime moment. So how old were you really, at the time when really you went, in 2019 in. when that when you won? I was it was the what was that right after my 22nd or 29th birthday or 20 my birthday is the 22nd I forget when the VMAs were they were either a week after or something like that yeah wow. it was after so I just turned yeah that's right I was I just turned 29. <laughs> Music video of the year. Yeah, we, I went out there. We won. Then I went to Burning Man right after and celebrated. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, it was a really, like that period of time, that like th- that two month period of time mm-hmm. between finishing the Calm Down video, shooting the Lover video, finding out about the VMAs on the Lover set. Oh, wow. Uh, going to new york for the awards my birthday winning going to burning man after that it was yeah like all these awesome phone calls and it just everything was so great and i kept taking it all in yeah how many so obviously after something like that happens i would imagine your inbound of emails yeah. probably goes up absolutely because nuts. it's an immediate it's an immediate cosign of like this guy just got music video of the year he's incredibly talented yeah it was it was wild i had a lot of work emails and then i had a ton of taylor swift fan emails really those were those are uh, a different level of fandom like it was Send i still get them i mean it's it's to crazy this day. yeah but within the three month period of both videos releasing it i mean i had to take my email off my website for a little bit because it was just so crazy i mean and and everyone around me too i mean all the crew my reps and producers and yeah wow was there what was there a big uh next job that came from it or was there any specific opportunity that came whether it's a lunch with somebody or is there anything that you could highlight from it uh, I mean, yeah, uh, there was a handful of them. Uh, I ended up doing signing with a commercial company, mm-hmm. which I'd always wanted, uh, and then signing with a film and TV company as well. Huge. So I just knew that you know these were the next steps, and it was awesome that they were like coming to me after the last however many years I've been like knocking on their doors and getting shut down. Mm. So because of that opportunity, was that the was that the next step that allowed you to really go into the commercial world as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I was ready to do that. I've been ready to do that. I could have been doing these commercials five years ago and no one would give me the shot. Like they just needed, they, they, I mean the fact that I had Taylor and, and John legend and like these bigger Khloe Kardashian, like these bigger, bigger names, the commercial clients, they love that. Or the commercial agencies, like they, 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 they know you can deal with, High level people. Exactly. So, yeah, it just, uh, it was something I always wanted. And, and now I'm, I'm very emerged in that world. Mm. 
how do you approach commercial versus music video? Because I feel like that's probably got to be. T- you, what's interesting is there. I forget the. I think it was like a hairspray company. There's yeah uh, on your website. It's like yeah, Batiste. Yeah, you still are. Yeah, it's you're still well, it's like funny a Drew Kirsch piece, but yeah. it's now a brand. And yeah. I was like mind blown that you were able to translate that so easily. Well, yeah, I know it's nuts because now they are coming to me like, oh yeah, we actually like we're looking for more of a music video director than a commercial director. So you're the guy you have got a ton of music videos and and then now that i have commercials i'm getting i get that still but i'm at least able to do other commercials that aren't so music heavy or like record you know so um yeah it's been it's been interesting it's been really cool to like grow my portfolio on, on that side of things yeah do you so do you see that it's more commercial i mean you have the film you're, you talked about that's coming up but mm-hmm. are you leaning more towards commercial versus music now that you've already established yourself or no it's stor- more stor- towards music yeah okay. but uh it's just nice to like have both like have everything it's like look you can do he can do this he can do that he's got this look he's got that look like it's mm-hmm. just I've got enough to like go to the table for specific jobs and, and be like, Oh, you, you think like this is too colorful or this is too bright. Like, we'll like look at this job. And mm-hmm. that's what I'm like really working on now is still want to have like my own look. Right. But I get pigeonholed sometimes and I'm sick of it. So yeah. Mm. These haters, man, they want to pigeonhole the man. They're Come like, on. Oh, he only does stuff that's colorful and glossy. And- Come on. Yeah. So, so you, how, how far out are you booking your schedule now? I feel like that as a filmmaker, that's, or at least yeah. for the type of work you do where it's very extensive, there's a lot of planning. How, how do you even schedule all this? I'd say everything's like a one to two months pre-scheduled. Um, so it's a, oh, so it is a decently quick yeah, turnaround. Except for the film stuff. Like the film, I know we're going to probably shoot March of next year. Wow. So like that is a little bit different, but commercials usually get, there's like a two to three week period of knowing if I'm going to have the job or not. And then after that, it's like three more weeks of planning, a few days of shooting, a few weeks of prep. I mean, of post-production and then, yeah. Wow. I mean, I just shot something. I've been in Ukraine for the last, I saw that like month. We shot something for Sony over there and, uh, the product that we shot doesn't come out until October. So the commercial doesn't come out until just a few weeks before that. Wow, so pretty long time. Wow, they're that they're far, all, they're they're all that di- far in advance. They're all different. I've had some come out four days later after the shoot. So literally, they take them home, edit them, edit the footage that night. We approve it the next day, color it that night or the next day, sign off, release it. Wow, it's crazy. What was the reason to go to Ukraine? Was that just where they wanted the video to be shot? Or? No, it was just uh, when we get some of these jobs where we bid them in different places uh Mm. different places inside the u.s and then overseas as well and it's just uh, a lot more uh budget friendly to shoot Mm. in eastern europe as you can imagine yeah i I would yeah ukraine was was really cheap for this job um you know certain jobs you wouldn't be able to go over there for specific reasons uh technical reasons but yeah, love so you, shooting. You would, you would just fly out your entire team that you would work. No, with? no. we fly out like certain people that need to be there. Like we have, like we, I think we had like two producers, myself, uh, a few other people. Sometimes you fly in your cinematographer, and then the rest Depends. you would just find out there people that yeah. Can help on like set. I'm going to St. Louis two weeks from now to shoot a job, and like we'll fly in a cinematographer, fly in an art director, two producers, myself, and maybe like a cast member and that's it. And then everyone else will source locally. Wow. Yeah. That makes sense. Especially if it's uh, something that can be easily sourced and you're not, there's no need to yeah. fly in, put up all so these many great people. places to shoot in the world. And even inside the United States, I love shooting in Austin, Texas, I have a great crew out there. Mm. Atlanta is like crushing it. New Mexico. Um, yeah. All great. Damn. And it's probably fun too. Cause it's completely different. Uh, backgrounds and like nature exactly. and definitely pushes you outside yeah and on the personal side it's great because you get travel. to travel yeah it's amazing you, so yeah this makes sense because you're talking about earlier about how you don't like sitting at the same desk working at the same time or yes. you know at the same position so i would yes. imagine you being able to travel is just completely yeah. wow humans are interesting because i'm the opposite i need i need this little location behind me because it's like i know where everything is i control this environment 
I can, nobody's going to come interrupt me. Yeah. But I also understand, and I have plenty of people, plenty of friends like you where everything's always got to be changing and they'll literally move yeah. their, their room around daily just to add more creativity to yeah. them. Well, I used to edit on like a big desktop, like huge screens in a room and that was where I was editing. But then like, I wanted to edit at like a coffee shop and like all these other places. But when I would do so, I would have my little computer and it was just, I like couldn't look at that little of a screen to like edit on. Like I needed more space, like, like screen space. So what I did was just got rid of all that stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to train myself to edit on a little tiny thing. So a t- tiny screen so I can edit on the airplane and edit like everywhere I want to. Wow. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I do everything off of a 17 inch laptop. I don't edit everything anymore, but is yeah. that hard to let go of that part of the process or do you, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm still very part of the process, but yeah, I mean, I've edited almost everything up until a year and a half ago, two years ago. So, um, very hard. I like, I do love the editing process. Which huh. You won't hear it from a lot of people. I yeah. Like, hate it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I grew up on computers and yeah, it's part of the, it. it's part of what, yeah, it's if, if you've been doing it this entire time and you're stepping away, I mean, the beauty of it is you get to learn the process and you know how to do it. But obviously if you want to keep scaling mm-hmm. and you want to do these massive projects, you don't have the time to go into a whole edit, pr- you know, production yeah. process because why you have to move on yeah. to the next one, right? Yeah. So I stopped. It was like, all right, you've stopped editing. You're going to save two weeks of time or a week of time. And during that time, you can be writing treatments or scripts or working mm. on other business venture, anything like that time is so valuable. Yeah. And so, yeah, I've had to, to let it go. And now I just watch cuts, give notes, go into that editing room when I can sit behind an editor, try not to sit over his shoulder to, or his or her shoulder too much <laughs> because I know what that feels like. You just want them to do their work, come check in, keep it moving. Yeah, they're full-time editors. They are good at what they do. Like, let them do their thing is how I look at it. And then when it's time, I come in and, and give my notes or, or whatever. And it can be frustrating because you just want to, like, grab the mouse and, like, get in there. But <laughs> Let me do this. Yeah, but no, I've learned a lot about it and getting better. Well, the, the treatment thing you just brought up, that's for most people that listen – they might not understand, but a treatment is essentially like a way to write your your pitch for a project. Um, and I would imagine these are pretty extensive, time consuming. Very. How how do you keep a positive mindset when you spend a lot of time and energy on this treatment and then it gets shot down? Yeah, I mean, at first that was such a heartbreaker but now i've done hundreds and gotten <laughs> shut down on hundreds i wonder what the percentage of that i've gotten shut down on. i think it would blow people's minds i think because yeah. it's it's definitely up it's i guess like 85 percent wow of the stuff i've written has not been made i mean it, but you just keep Doing going it. and a lot of the times you can recycle these mm-hmm. ideas that took me a minute too to learn it's just rather than canon an idea save it come back to it you know, even when I get a, a new song now, like I'll go back through all my treatments that I never got made and just see if like, even if it's not like that idea, it might spark something and you use that imagery from that treatment or, or something. Mm. So I'd like to think that they still help me out. Yeah. <laughs> it, it might not come to fruition this moment, but it somehow is going to get full circled back into. It's crazy, man. I mean, early on I was really writing I'd write five a week and wow. not get any. It's crazy. Do you get now because of the credibility, because of the scale and the the level of you've done projects at this point, is a lot of the time now it's just like clients are coming to you and just like, we want you to do this project, mm-hmm. pitch us three different ideas, we'll go with one of them. Or do you are you still finding yourself yeah. having to write treatments and then you don't even get the job? I'd say it's like seventy thirty. Like seventy are coming to me, like it's great. I if they're not coming to me, they're coming to me and like two others. Mm. Um, and then occasionally I get something that they'll be like, yeah, you, you don't have this job, but if you want to write on it, you know, give us an idea and, and maybe we'll work together. Mm. And if I love it that much, I'll, I'll go for it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I guess that's just part of, part of the process of, uh, yeah, of doing it. Yeah. I wrote one this morning and I wrote one yesterday. <laughs> Just pumping them out? Yeah, I mean... How, how long does it take? Dude, is it just like a oh, piece of paper? Is no, it like a I deck? Mean, at first it took a while. Now I've I've got, you know, like a few templates I kind of use. And mm. uh, I keep them shorter now because 
fortunately I can because they know kind of what they're getting from me for the most part, you know, unless I'm trying to write something that's like way different from anything I've ever done. But, uh, you know, a lot of my references and my past work kind of go hand in hand and I think you just kind of get it yeah. for the most part. So they're really focused on the actual meat of the script. Yeah. Sometimes I, I won't even do Im- imagery anymore. I'll just give them a word document. This like, is what you're getting. This is what it is. And like, this is the mood. Hmm. And, uh, if you want to talk more, let's have a conversation and then I can give you go a, farther a into treatment. the process. Yeah. Cause I'm not going to waste two days. And yeah, yeah. you you figure that out probably the hard way at this point. Yep. Definitely. Do you, I, what, what is your creative process? Like, I'm, I'm so like, I think this is so different for everybody. Like, are you, t- are you somebody that has a schedule every day? Like today you woke up knowing that like 10 a.m. you want to start working or is it kind of just like you roll out of bed, roll check, out of bed. Oh, I love it. And you just, you just go with the flow. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I obviously have a calendar and there's meetings and things scheduled. Totally. And so, but I just go day by day and, but yeah, I mean this morning it wouldn't have mattered if I would have woken up at six or 9 a.m. Yeah. It's up to me. Yeah. Which is why I'm like, like it goes back to the whole, like never wanted to do a nine to five. And like, I love having the freedom. Oh, totally. It's you incredible. Do what you want. Like, yeah, could, I could have gone, I don't surf, but I could have gone surfing <laughs> this morning. I could, I can go to the gym. I can lay in bed all like, you know, it's yeah. like, it's really nice to have that freedom. Have you always had, obviously when you're when you're early on your career you're you're probably taking every job and every opportunity and trying to exactly show the show your own potential so i'm i'm imagining you have it hasn't always been like this like it was probably a call it probably took years of just like yes 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 to every opportunity grinding cut edit produce yeah just tell every early videographer or director or cinematographer to do that Hmm. just like shoot everything like you never know i mean you never know who you're going to meet, who, what you're going to learn. Mm. Even if, I mean, I've had done videos that I might've done like three, four or five years ago that someone watches, they love, and then I'm being hit up wow. for, you know, so I, especially just early on, it's, it's, it's so good to, to shoot everything. It'll, yeah. Just take any take opportunity it, yeah, that comes exactly. across your lap. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many non paid gigs I had done. Too many. Too many. <laughs> yeah. Too many, man. Not enough sleep early on. Yeah. I, yeah. I believe it. How I, I heard in a past interview that sometimes depending on the set could be anywhere from 30 to a hundred people on a set, which mm-hmm. is obviously a lot of people. How, how do you, how have you learned to manage people and how have you learned to be a good leader to make sure that not only are they getting the job done, but they're motivated and that, and they're somewhat enjoying the process of the actual shoot. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, still learning that. I think I'll always be learning that. Um, but you know, trying to just have that good energy on set and it's so hard to remember sometimes cause you have so much going on in your head creatively and logistically. And you've got clients to deal with, you've got or managers or, all of the crew, someone has questions. I mean, so there's a lot. So it's like, just, just try to be nice. Mm. Like that first and foremost, uh, I'm not great at remembering names. So I'm like, if I'm not gonna be able to do that all the time, like at least be really nice. <laughs> be a nice guy. Now I have people actually, I have my assistant director write me down people's names, like, or I have them wear in Ukraine. We had everyone wear a name tag. That's the way it should be. And I was like, well, this is amazing. Like, now, I, <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've done certain things like, um, gifts for everyone on, on set. Wow. I'll take some of my pay and and delegate it. You know, a certain amount of it for a gift. For I mean, like on Taylor's video, I got everyone like custom socks. Wow, that's cool. With like different things on them, but yeah. People take um, notice little things like that. I feel like it goes a long yeah, way. Yeah, it does. It's, that's exactly it. It's like the little things like that. You know, it's, it's it means a lot, and uh, I love doing it. So, yeah. Yeah, and it probably makes people more motivated to work harder for you because they're like, this guy's taking care of us or he actually cares about me as a human yeah, being. Yeah, a kid actually just ran into this kid last weekend. His name was Skyler. He was a um, hostess at a restaurant. And I checked in and he was like, wait, he's like, Drew Kirsch? Like, from the Lover Taylor Swift music wow. video? And, and I was like, yeah, what? Like, who? I didn't, I didn't know who he was. Yeah. And he was like, well, I was in the video. I like, I was one of the cast members. I was an extra. Wow. And, uh, 
he was so nice and he was just like, I just want to say like, that was like my favorite thing and you were super great. And I, it just, I felt like so good hearing that. I was like, really? Oh man. Like, and I was like, I hope I was nice. <laughs> like, but you know, he, 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 yeah, he was really great. And so try to remember just to be nice, be nice to everyone as everyone should be. Yeah. That's the way I've always treated it. It's like, you don't know how, um, you know, a relationship could impact you or, it's just like doing it for the right reasons. And even if it's not because you want to be nice to get something out of somebody, but more so just like that energy of making people feel good somehow always comes back to you. And I think uh, yeah. it it will pay off in long dividends um, in the long term. If you yeah. can make people feel good, they're going to want to keep totally. you around them. It was scary at first too, because a lot of these guys I've, and girls I've been working with on set are older than like way way older than me mm -hmm. at some points now i'm getting old so but oh, uh come on but uh no like they're you know it's intimidating a little bit like when i've got like a 45 year old like grip who's like maybe not the nicest guy in the world or or it's just hard to like you know go up and appreciate sometimes when yeah. it was so but i mean that the, 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 i learned so much like on some of the bigger ones and like the Taylor one, the first Taylor one was so massive that, you know, a lot of these guys were big major players, uh, in terms of the crew members. Um, so, so even, like so even, and, even within, even within, um, the world of like set, like there's going to be a DP that's like the known person or like, there's going to be a grip that's like known on every set. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah. I just mean like some of the, the, you know, uh, grips and some of the crew members had mm. worked with Nolan and David Fincher and I'm the guy who's producing my job in like two weeks from now did Fight Club like wow. it's just crazy to be around these people that like you know those are big massive jobs that I've looked up to and and to be around them is like an honor yeah um, and you just want to make sure also that you know you're getting a good look yeah you're yeah so what was it about Fight Club? Because in college, that yeah. really inspired Fight Club, you. the book, was a book that was given to me by an English teacher. Uh, and I had seen Fight Club, the movie, a handful of times. But um, she taught me a lot of like the themes in Fight Club. Uh, more about the book than what I thought it was, which was like just like fighting and like being a man. Mm. And when I learned about those themes, it kind of just like opened my mind up a little bit. Mm. Uh, and then she became like one of my bigger mentors. Uh, so that, that was kind of, it just holds a very like special place mm. to me. That was, uh, professor Bartley. Was that the name? Pro Pro professor Bartley, Bartley, yeah. Bartley. Interesting. Yeah. It's crazy how, uh, certain teachers or professors can be either. It's a class, it's a moment, it's a conversation. It's a lecture that it can redefine the way you see something, the path you go on. Cause there, there was a, a teacher that I had in high school until this day, I feel like she's the reason I am where I am today and like taking that unorthodox path and mm -hmm. giving me the confidence so that, you know, when I graduated college, I didn't just get a nine to five that I was yeah. pursuing something I was actually passionate about. And yeah, it just takes that one conversation or that one light bulb moment where it's like, Oh, this yeah. is actually the path that I should be going on. Yeah. I mean, I, I always grew up just, I didn't have a, my best relationship with teachers growing up. So I didn't really like a lot of teachers and that's just how I thought the world was until you know, I just thought that they always like had to follow the rules or they always did follow the rules and some do. And, uh, Bartley was different for me. Like, and she wasn't, you know, the, t the traditional teacher that I was used to. Mm. And that was like fascinating for me. So mm. it's all it takes. What's, uh, what's one lesson you've learned in the business that you carry with you in, in your life today? Hmm. Hmm, let me, let me, that's a good, that's a hard question. It's a very I'm sure hard there's question. A, I'm sure there's a lot. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't want to say something about communication. She wasn't ever the best communicator, uh, you know, like in personal relationships and, and things mm. like that. And I think storytelling and cinematography, I mean, and, and uh, filmmaking is, uh, is all about communicating Mm. working with your crews, communicating, working with the client, you know, working with the actor to communicate the story. Mm. Um, it's definitely taught me a lesson to do so in life and not, you know, not be quiet 
Yeah. What's so? What What's the right way to to communicate when you say that? Because I, I I know to actually communicate is what I mean. I'm there's just so many times where I just like I hold stuff in or I uh, don't care to. Yeah, I just don't. I don't want the. Um, I don't want a conflict, or mm-hmm. I don't want to speak up about something. Mm-hmm. And I think that when you don't do that, things just get worse. Mm-hmm. And so communication is definitely like a one that just kind of comes to mind. Um, definitely some like business uh, relationship uh, stuff that definitely helps too. You also need, need to learn when to keep your mouth shut, mm. you know? Um, yeah. I wish I could give you something better. No, right it's now, good. I, I think the communication is really important because I think there's a lot of times people hold back from speaking up and it's, it, it's, a, it is communication support, but it's also how you communicate. Yeah. Right. So it's like, if I have a problem with somebody, it's not me going like my blood pressure rising. It's not me allowing this me to get uh, very overwhelmed. It's about still remaining calm, collective, explaining the way I feel and, you know, vouch and understanding where they're coming from. But that, that in of itself is what I have found to be the most crucial piece of life doing business, relationship building. Mm-hmm. I mean, just the magnitude of our things, how you communicate, not only is it important to communicate, but how you communicate to somebody yeah. makes all the difference, especially if you're on set and this actor's not nailing the part, mm-hmm. whatever, freaking out on the guy or girl, it's not gonna help anything. It's gonna yeah. make them more or anxious. But if you can get them calm and say, hey, it's all good. Yeah, We're here for you. We're gonna take our time. And it's like all of a sudden now they're focused. Now they feel better, but yeah. yeah I mean, Whether it's a sports key. team or a tech startup, yes. Or a film, yeah. or what, or your relationship. It is communication is key. Yeah, and it's definitely something that I've learned. Yeah, through the business uh, and just being self aware. Yeah, that's the big one right there. Yeah, self awareness is the is the key. What's uh What's an area of your life you need to put more effort into? Hmm. On the business side, life, brother. What's an What's one area of your life you need to put more you effort? Get into? my ass to the gym. I know Come that. on. Um, we got a gym right outside for you to God, use anytime yeah. you need it. That and probably, I mean, no, I have enough time for myself. I'm trying to, people are always like, you're so busy all the time. You, But like, yeah, I am. But I'm, I also like, I have plenty of fun. It's not oh, like yeah. I'm not like taking time I see, for I see myself. You out, I see you out in Vegas partying up. Yeah. Sun's rising. I'm like, God. Damn. So like, I mean, but between like that, between that and work, you feel like you're in a good spot right now? It's just all like, yeah, of course. I'm in a great spot. It's just, it's, you're constantly going, but that's how I want it to be. Yeah. And some people I think are like, man, like, how do you do that? Or like, why do you want to do that? Because like, you no, love what like, you I'm, do. Yeah. Like you just, you just go, go, go. I guess yeah. if I'm ever don't have something to do, I freak out. Mm. How difficult is it to maintain a relationship with this lifestyle of like you, your project, your flying out to different places for extended periods of time. Yeah, it's definitely hard. Yeah, definitely hard. Um, but it depends on who you're in the relationship with. So mm. yeah, luckily I, I'm in a good one. So it's, I have a good you person. Find a way to I have a good person for that. Mm. So it works great. But that, you know, I, I've always thought to myself, I'm like, how how is this going to work? Like how is someone going to be able to date me? You know? Did you naturally just go with the flow of life and allow it to come to yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's interesting how when you double down on yourself, I feel like the world yeah. kind of puts everything else into place. Yeah. It's weird, right? A lot of people well, that happens hear that all the time. People yeah. like, Yeah, I wasn't looking for it and it happened, but Yeah. Yeah, it's really great. It's that the the one thing that uh I feel honored about uh doing this podcast and meeting people like yourself is that the one commonality, because I interview all different types of people, not just filmmakers, it's entrepreneurs, it's go-getters, it's podcasters, it's creators, it's it's a magnitude of different people, but the commonality with all these guests similar to you is like, you truthfully wake up every day with a sense of direction. I'm not saying that every day you're like up at 6 a.m. working on the, the, the treatment and like, yeah. but you know at the end of the day what you're here to do and like what the ultimate overall purpose is. And that's such a, that's a, such a, beautiful thing and and the and the beauty of it too is that by you continuously following this path the everyone you're surrounded by is exactly on that same level of like they all know what they're here to do and they're all working towards it and of course there's always room for improvement but um 
it's really just a beautiful thing to see outside looking in because I can think back to a few years ago when I was in college and didn't know what I wanted to do. I can, I, I have buddies of mine I went to high school with that are calling me now and are just like spend a lot of years just partying and not really doing the self uh, deep work to figure out who they want to be or what they want to do. And um, it's really amazing to speak to people like you who found it and are doubling down on it. And it's, uh, it's cool. It's, it's amazing. It's inspiring. It's, uh, and you do it at a very high level too, man, which is really Thank cool you, to man. see. Thank you so much. It's very cool to see that. You know, surround yourself with other people who are doing this kind of stuff, I think. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, I'm not saying you want to be a director, surround yourself with directors, surround yourself with people who want to do something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I think it's very important. The energy just comes right back to you. Um, two final quick questions. What's the first step anyone can take to reaching their inner potential? I I was thinking you were gonna ask me something along that on when you were on the our last little topic and I kind of I don't <laughs> I, I, when you were talking about like working on yourself and stuff like because people ask me that all the time but mm. I don't know it was different for me I was going through some shit and like what I was just going I mean I had a vision of very low self esteem um, I was. Uh, I didn't think I was good at anything, really. I mean, I was up until, up until post college when you started to go in. And until I until I had that teacher, really. Wow. And until college, yeah. So, but before that, I mean, I was scared. I think, and that just like that, I yeah. So I if like, I had I'm gonna actually- do something, I was. I don't want to be in the gutter. Like I don't want to be that guy. Like I was like I want to, to do something with my life, and I just I, that was it. Like I was like I want it, and. People ask me like, "How you know? How do I do that or something?" I'm like, "I don't, I don't have an answer yet, but mm. but I'd say look around, like try different things, because that, that that was it for me. It was like it was trying different things and opening my mind up." Yeah, well, it, that's so interesting to hear because it's like uh, we spend so much of our like you you. And it was the same way with me. It wasn't until probably around the same. It was li- actually right after college for me. So I I like feel it's a similar path of like i'm 27 now i didn't even start podcasting until i was 22 yeah probably right around the time you left college or you know night whatever it was 2021 but um it's like this belief of like throwing a bunch of ideas at the wall something six and you just decide this is the thing i'm gonna do and you just do it yeah yeah i mean definitely i and and throughout the process or throughout my career i've been i've tried other things like I've tried clothing brands. I've tried, you know, they were side hustles, but at least I tried them and like yeah. they failed, but like I tried them and like, who knows, maybe if I would have really, really loved one of those, I would have like tossed out filmmaking and like gone that, that route, that route and like whatever that, that that's okay. Like if for, yeah. for people to do. So, I mean, I think that you're, that was, that was pretty good yeah. how you explained it. Um, you definitely just got to try things. You can't be scared to try things. Yeah. And you believed in yourself. That's to me the most clear thing from outside looking in from how you've gotten to this place in your life. I was just mad at, I was mad about it. Mm. I, I don't know if I was mad at myself or mad at other, uh, it just, I grew up man with like coach baseball coaches who would, who weren't the best mm. for my confidence and, even some of my friends, like it, it just didn't, wasn't there for me up until college that I wow. finally like hit that stride. And I was like, you know what? Kind of F the world type of mentality. I'm going to show these people who they've been messing yeah, with. Yeah. I mean, someone actually specifically said to me that moving to LA is a terrible idea and, uh, you won't ever make it. Like they used an example. They were like, do you know, they're like, you could be a, 300 pound they said like a 300 pound like redhead actor and you're gonna go down to la and you think you're gonna like do this certain role for this uh job that requires a 300 pound redheaded person so you're gonna show up and there's gonna be a hundred other 300 pound redheaded people that you have to compete with all the whatever that was like this shitty example you gave me and uh yeah he i mean essentially was like yeah there's hundreds of kids down in LA trying to do what you're going to do, what it's going to make you differently. And that just, that pissed me off. So I'd be happy though. Cause it was like, all right, now I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I, I wonder what that person's thinking now, seeing what you've done, but it's a little moments like that. 
it, it, it gives you, uh, it adds more fuel to the fire. Cause I had people questioning me when I graduated college, you just went to a top business school in the Northeast. You're going to graduate college, not get a job, drive Uber full time and try to build a yeah. podcast career. You've never created, you've never podcast before. And look where I'm at now, baby. Yeah, there you go. So it's the same. Yeah. It's the same and, shit. It, and I, by the way, I didn't finish college. That was also a you big, dropped out. Yeah. It was also a big like thing when like all my friends, parents are like, Oh, so how's college? How was college? Even to this day, people will ask, I don't care anymore. Yeah. I'm like, I'm fine. Yeah, but you, you left, but, like, then, but then you went to Safari University. Exactly, that's what you call that's it. Right. And people would be like, yeah, where, uh, where'd where you go to school? Where'd you graduate? And for a, a long time, I was kind of embarrassed to say I didn't until I proved everyone that you could do it. Yeah. Um, it's part of the story, though. Yeah, Safari University. Yeah. I mean, it's just... I've never heard it before. That comes from the <laughs> L.A. snob kids that I'd met moving down here mm. that were all from you know different different film schools or different art universities and so i used to say yeah i went to safari they'd be like oh no way that's crazy that's cool it's like yeah you don't even you know don't what even that know. is but you don't even know <laughs> but that's the, even even the fact that you didn't get into the it was ucla or was UC, usc ucla yeah it, it, it adds more to the story man sorry i also don't advocate anyone to not go to film school film school is great totally and that if I had happy had the opportunity, I totally would have gone. And totally. I just did it, and I made it work without it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's great. Uh, final question for you: Somebody that listened to this entire podcast today, they made it through fifty-five minutes for or fifty-ish minutes. What's one challenge you have for the listener today? For example, some of the challenges in the past have been, you know, start the thing you've always wanted to start, get a better fit, you know, health lifestyle. It can be literally any challenge. They made it this far on the podcast. What's one challenge you have for them? Let's say do do something that is completely outside of your realm. If you're not an artist, if you're not a painter, you think you suck at painting, go buy a canvas and go paint something. Mm. Maybe paint a few things. If you think you can't cook, go spend 50 bucks at the grocery store on a bunch of random (laughs) shit and try to cook it. You never know what will happen. And... It might fail. It probably will fail, but Mm. there's a chance it won't. And there's a chance that something might come from this experience. So, or this experiment. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think, I think that's just like, I love the outside the box. Yeah. Outside the box thinking, you know, it's just like, go do something you've never done before. It would be, you might learn something. Yeah. They say, uh, living in constant discomfort ends up leading to the greatest growth. And by doing these things that feel uncomfortable at some point, you know, when you picked up the camera for the first time, or I started this yeah. firing up these mics for the first time, it, it is uncomfortable. It's scary. You're like, what am I doing? What go is this? Go check out Burning Man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Learn a lot. Oh, I bet. Uh, that's, I gotta, I gotta cross that off the bucket list at some point, but uh, yeah, that's great. Drew, honestly, man, like I said, uh, you know, really appreciate you taking the time to come today. When we had met a few weeks ago um, and Como had uh, introduced this real briefly in my mind, I was like, I fucking know who this guy is, but I don't want to be like, yo, Drew, I know all your music videos, blah, blah, blah. But I had to sit there and play it cool. I think I waited three minutes and I was like, yeah, uh, I know who you are, man. But uh, I mean, literally you, seeing man. the work you've done, it's inspiring. So I, I'm not even a filmmaker and uh, just seeing the level you've, you've done it at, uh, it's inspiring. And especially, you know, kind of doing some research for this podcast today, just listening to another podcast, reading some past interviews, very clear to me that you're passionate about what you do. You do it for a, a great reason of not only is it fulfilling to you, but it's also like kind of, I mean, it, it, it's almost like a, an example for other people. Like you were 19, 20, decided to do this thing 10 years later of doing it consistently. You've gotten to a very high level and clearly there's a lot more levels to go. But uh, I re- if there's anything that I really appreciate and respect, it's people's time. And I know you got a lot of shit happening on your life. So taking time today to be on this is an honor and I, I really appreciate no, you're you great, it. man. You're super great. Made this easy and, and casual. So thank you so much. Thank you, man. And well, thanks let- for anyone who's listening. <laughs> that means the world. If anyone is listening, That's it my- means the world to me. So thank well, you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this podcast, please, please, please. Drew and I have a little favorite ask more so me than him. Uh, screenshot this episode, post it to your IG story, tag Drew. That's Drew Kirsch, D R E W K I R S C H. Tag him and tag me at Bob A. That's B O, three B's, four A's, and a Y. Share out the podcast on your IG story. Let us know what the biggest takeaway, what the greatest learning was. Would be very super curious 
to hear that. I will have Drew's website linked up below. I highly, highly, highly suggest you take a moment today. Check out some of his music videos. Uh, Tough with Quinn 92 is great. Girlfriend with Charlie Puth is fantastic. Taylor Swift's great. I mean, his work, his work is fantastic. So please take a moment today and check it out. And I don't think you will be disappointed. Drew Kirsch, thank you for being on the show today, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, man. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Beard of Man podcast. See you.